Jason, for those that haven't come across you online, introduce yourself and tell our listeners what we're talking about today. I'm Jason Chenard. I'm a practicing pharmacist and a pharmacy manager in a corporate store, but my wife and I also own our own two pharmacies. And I'm the founder of a pharmacy leadership and wellness platform at layeredleadership.ca. All right. Now, Jason, first, I got to jump into that. You own two pharmacies, but you're not working at those. I'm imagining it's because your wife kicked you out. <laughs> that's that's a logical answer. But that's Although not the not, answer. Yeah, that's I, No, I shouldn't say that. Actually, this doesn't happen without my wife. She's a base of a lot of the systems that we've created together in the yeah. last decade and a half. We graduated the same year out of U of T in 08 and never thought we would be owners. When we graduated, the corporate world was big and it was taking over and things are starting to change where, you know, pharmacists are venturing out and taking it upon themselves and using the newer scope and different activities that were being used and making it happen. And the, the world has shifted to be, at least in Ontario, probably 50-50 in terms of corporate pharmacy and independent pharmacy. And I think there's pros and cons to both, of course. The company I work for is a great one. And the stores that we operate are about an hour outside of mm. where I practice. So we've hired a pharmacy manager in each of our stores that sign the prescriptions, deal with the patients. That allows me to sort of beat the vision and the strategy, take care of the staff, take care of IT, and set the overall plan. And when we were buying the first pharmacy from the owner, it's in a small rural town in Northern Ontario, and all the conversations kept having the theme of the, I'm tired, you know, burnout wasn't the word he was using, but it was yeah. certainly part of the theme. And that's when I had a decision to make. Do I go and be the guy over there and be him? Or can I keep the good situation that I'm in, in the corporate pharmacy and still have potentially a bigger impact in not having to be the guy there, sign every prescription and do every shot, but still create impact, maybe create a new job for somebody and in a position that it, the store didn't have before so that we could be available to the community and be available to whatever the future brings pharmacy. And a year down the road, an opportunity came to, to create the second location. And things like that wouldn't have been possible if I would have been the guy signing every prescription and been there sort of handcuffed to the dispensary. Jason, why was the first purchase, though, an hour away. What precipitated that to buy one that far away? An hour drive wasn't much for our geography here. I got you. You know, it, it's a nice, smooth drive on a four-lane highway that, you know, you can put a podcast in or think about the workday and not be in front of your patients. When you get to the outskirts, this area, it's a, a small community. Everyone knows everybody. Super nice. Very relaxing things close early and the pharmacy is a staple of the one strip of business yeah. that there is in the town. So it, it's a very different culture or atmosphere, a much more relaxed one than typically in a bigger town. I remember when our second child was born, I was taking a nap on the couch and my wife came over and she woke me up. She's like, Mike, we've got two kids now and you can't nap right now. That was like the last nap I took in like 30 years. I'm just kidding. I took one the next day, but it sounds right. But when there's three kids, then that's when you really start your family because you're kind of outnumbered and so on. I think of that with pharmacies too. I only own one pharmacy. And I think if I own two pharmacies, two wouldn't set the business up right because I still could sort of do it. You could run over there and kind of do it. When you get three or you get one that's an hour away, you're forced right away to set up the structure correctly instead of catching scraps from the owner 
you're forced to set it up correctly. So I think that's cool that you have that distance because it forces things. I think that if you asked any of my colleagues that know me, they would certainly point to the system development automation part of my brain. And they would agree that's probably a strength. When I graduated, I was, I was given an opportunity to manage a long-term care corporate pharmacy. And that was a baptism by fire situation. I was just trying to, I was trying to figure out how to be a pharmacist, let alone to be a boss. And then to manage a thousand nursing home beds across Northern Ontario with a 3,000 scripts a day with pill pack technology and learn how to run that side of the business. Everything is just bigger and meaner and less forgiving. And I think it allowed me to be a manager and a structurer a lot faster. And I look at what I do today and I think I would never have been able to do that 10 years ago. And I, it's sort of a you're, when you're forced, I think you learn to do it faster. And I'm, I've made a lot of mistakes in those times, but luckily none of them were the type of mistakes that allow me to move backwards instead of forwards, I suppose. Yeah, I think every family business probably... Over the years of managing the larger teams and being part of the more corporate environments, I've had to step up and speak. I've had to run meetings and I've had to be on committees and I've had to be the chair of maybe it's P&D or maybe it's some other committee. And I naturally have sort of been put in positions where I'm either the spokesperson for something or the guy that has to answer to something. And I think you know, whether it be all the way from high school, being part of student council or being part of the local chamber of commerce and then becoming the president of that group for a while. Just naturally, I've been put in positions where I've been the spokesperson and had to speak on behalf of a group. And I think when I was able to pair that with pharmacy, naturally, you're becoming a speaker at a pharmacy conference became a goal of mine. It was something I was very interested in. If you had a message and you could potentially positively impact another group of your colleagues that you would never work with day to day, then that's a significant, a significant win. And when you're on stage and you're talking to hundreds of strangers and you're able to connect your brain with theirs for an hour and give them something tangible that they can walk away with. I think the reach that we have as a pharmacist extends way beyond the dispensary in that moment. And that's something that you're proud of and that you see progress in. And I've always used writing as a way of figuring things out. And people have told me over the years that I need to start putting this on paper, whatever this is. But what I started doing naturally was over the years of trying to figure out how to be a pharmacist, a manager, a dad, a triathlete, a hockey player, I've always written my thoughts out. And when they were out of my head and on paper, then I could sleep at night and I could come back to it with a fresh mind the next day and find a good solution. And I think three years ago, I started writing, but we had the stores established and we had the kids already. And I was trying to I realized that over two years of journal entries, looking back, I figured out that I was trying to find what a leader was, what the definition of a leader was from a pharmacist's point of view. And it was not something that you were taught in school. But having been a pharmacy manager for over a decade and having to recruit pharmacy managers in my own two stores, if I knew exactly what the ideal characteristics of a pharmacy leader were, then I would be able to emulate those myself and find those types of people and put them into the stores that I own. And what was interesting was over two years of journaling, there was seven characteristics that I call them leadership dimensions, that just in the stories and anecdotes of being in the trenches, those seven themes kept coming up over and over again. Things like humility and systems and structure and discipline. And I decided this is general enough of an idea 
and I should, if I'm going to go any deeper and keep writing to figure out whatever I'm looking for, then I better trademark it and make it the base of what I'm doing because this is how it started. So that's how layered leadership started, was using those seven characteristics to help figure out what pharmacy leaders need to be and to sort of figure out what I could give them that they haven't gotten from school. So I think of layered leadership as a sort of leadership and wellness platform for pharmacists and their teams that allows them to optimize the health of their pharmacy without sacrificing their own. Because many pharmacists have a burnout version of their story, and I have a fairly decent one. And during COVID, all of that was amplified. And I can't speak specifically to to the U.S., but I... From some colleagues that I connect with on LinkedIn, it seems like a pretty real thing. And I think eating right and sleeping right is a big part of it. And that's a lot of that nutrition and sleep is weaved into different parts of the blog the or the weekly newsletter. But fundamentally, I'm trying to give pharmacists something that allows them to be better leaders, to run better pharmacies, things that you can't learn in school without sacrificing themselves. Boy, not many people combine leadership in the business and leadership at home. There's very few people that pull both of them off. And a lot of people, I guess, they're quite visible when you hear about CEOs of these big tech companies and Jason Skirts and things like this. Pharmacists aren't that same profile, but that stress or that reason that those that are visible break apart is probably often those same stresses, the same pressures that that break apart these high profile people are the same ones that can break apart all of us, we're not all that different. Stresses are stresses. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Stress is stress. And it's hard to pull both of those off. I think what you're hinting at is work-life balance Yeah, as a buzzword, right? But we use it a lot without understanding it. And I just came back from a series of talks at some a couple pharmacy conferences out in Western Canada. And I got to meet some pharmacists in other provinces who have different scopes and we got to share a lot of cool ideas. But the difference is that we all fundamentally do the same job and we have the same goal and we do it in different ways. But there's the talk was on pharmacist burnout and what we can do tangibly at work and at home to prevent burnout. And it's amazing how everyone has their own story, whether they've been in practice for a year or 10 Everyone has a growth curve and a stress that's new. And it's almost as if we are working in silos that we're never sharing those stories. So we never learn from each other. And I think of the work side of the work-life balance equation as, look, you've got enough time at work. You spend 30, 40 hours there. You should be able to figure that side out. But if you don't have the life side figured out, you're not going to come to work prepared and ready to solve the work things. I grew up as a competitive hockey player and you're, you're used to grind and discipline. And when you translate some of those skills into pharmacy, you end up with a very hardworking person who can put up with a lot of stuff. And the personality of a pharmacist is this sort of type A planner, confrontation avoider who often we were waiving copays, we're giving discounts, we're putting patients first, and we're giving ourselves up for all of that. So if we don't figure out how to take care of ourselves first, then we won't be doing this as long as we could. It's also the other side of the coin too, where you get a business person who is relatively successful and that becomes their identity. And they won't maybe not think of it as a stress, but it's an easy identity producer, a lot easier than saying you're a family guy kind of thing. And mm -hmm. so 
I think families have it rough because if the business guy is stressed, they have problems. If the business guy or woman, if the business person's too successful, that's a stress on the family. So families are in for a long haul when you've got someone who's wrapped up in their business mind. I think at the end of the day, there's a certain, there's a passion that you're, you want to maintain at work. And in order to do that, you've got to have things dialed in at home. You've got to come to work happy. And that's difficult in pharmacy because of the grind and because you could easily end up punching the clock and waiting for your shift to be over and working for someone else who feels out of touch or isn't potentially contributing the same way that you are in your mind. I know for me, I've learned a lot about sleep in the last few years and that's where it starts for me. And if I go too long, with, the, with not getting to bed at the right time and not doing all of the sleep hygiene things that we teach patients because pharmacists are terrible at taking their own advice, right? Then I show up to work and I'm not rested. And when I'm not rested, then my meal planning slips and then I'm malnourished. And then the stresses of the job are heavier. So... I actually called my weekly newsletter rested, fueled, and ready because that's the emphasis of what I realize that makes me capable of being the best pharmacist that I can, and that I need to show up to work and I need to be rested, and then I need to be fueled. And then when I'm those things, I can be ready. And ready is sort of the leadership side of the platform. And that's where we talk about workflow. We talk about hiring and we talk about staff development. And that's essentially the emphasis of the blog that goes into my LinkedIn profile and goes into Canadian Healthcare Network. But the base of all of it is eating right and going to bed on time and taking care of ourselves so that, you know, we can take care of patients and our business and our staff and our family. Sleep's a hard one because it's so good for you. But a lot of people say you can't force it. It's like, well, I can't force myself to fall asleep if I'm doing this or that. But I think what you said there, Jason, I think you can if you set up certain structures of at least getting in bed at a certain time. It's having a power down type of routine. It's getting to bed around the same half hour to hour of each night and waking up around the same half hour to hour in each day, whether it's a work day or a day off or a weekend or a stat. You can't come home from work and shell out all of the shift in your mind, right? You've got to be able to decompress it and then shift it off and trust that you can solve it the next day and take off where you stopped. And then you can't go home and have a drink every night because alcohol will degrade your quality. And it'll just sort of shut off the frontal lobe and sedate you instead of get you into good sleep quality with good REM. And then you can't come home and binge eat because you didn't eat properly all day. All right, we're going to finish things up now, Jason. (laughs) I was following along and kind of nodding my head until you got to the binge eat part. We like to binge eat. Actually, I've got an eating disorder. I've got bulimia. I've just never gotten around to the throwing up part. (laughs) There's a lot of things that are taboo. Alcoholism, whatever, all the things that we know are not good for us, but there's some stuff that's not as taboo. And so Mm -hmm. that's where it's easier to go. It's not good for you, but it's easier to binge eat. Things that aren't so obvious, but it's still just numbing yourself down. Because of the pharmacy nonstop day, we have to ensure that we have the home part sorted out the right way so that it's therapeutic for what, for the difficulty that the pharmacy workday offers, right? I know for me, it's, if it's a 12 hour day and I have had half a lunch here or there, or I haven't planned food properly. Then I'm going to come home at 9.30 when I should be starting the power down process and getting high quality sleep with a cool room and a dark room and doing something relaxing that doesn't involve screens before bed. But 
you haven't felt like you have had very much fun all day. And you get home and you're still stressed and you're still pumped from the drug interactions you had to sort out or the confrontation you had in the evening with a patient or something that didn't work well. And then you want to have a snack and you want to watch the rest of the hockey game or you want to do something. And I think having the systems and knowing what works best for you at home will be in best balance if you if you know what those things are sleep wise and nutrition wise and that will set you up really well for the next day but it's so easy to let that go i think with a lot of pharmacists schedule is now our hours are shortened at the pharmacy and my habits are much better than they ever were i walk in the morning and i get to bed at a certain time it's just more of a natural flow i think a lot of the listeners and you've come across it. it's that evening shift and then you're up early the next morning and then this and it's tough on people but i think if you look at it there's probably only a couple different types of those there's one where you work late and one maybe where you work early something like that and if you think it out you can probably set up a structure. It might not be the same structure each day, but it might only be structure A and B, not like willy-nilly eat a box of honey bunches of oats one night kind of thing. I think you're right. I think it's having a plan. And that if you can consciously plan that out, then you're going to have the answer ahead of time, as opposed to having to ad hoc your way through what comes next and what comes after that. And if you have a plan and you have a reason for doing it, then it should be easy to follow. For me, that that plan will involve making sure that I've got enough energy for the family and, and for training. When I graduated pharmacy, I started running and I grew on me and I ran longer and longer distances. And then one year, I decided to sign up for a half marathon, and I had never done anything like that before. And I was learning how to how to ramp up volume, and so I started swimming a little, not knowing anything about what I was doing. But when you look up swimming on YouTube, you get a whole bunch of triathlon videos. Yeah, and I went, "Well, this is awesome. Why am I running for two hours when I could do biking?" This, and it grew on me, and I signed up for my first race the next summer. And I had nothing special of a performance, but I realized this was something that I can grow into. And this is something that gives me lifelong goals. Mm -hmm. And it should set up the type of lifestyle that a pharmacist would be successful in at work. Because if you're going to be a triathlete and you're going to train all winter for the summer races, then you're going to have to get to bed on time and you're going to have to eat the right way and you're going to have to weight train and you're going to have to do cardio. And you've got this nice mix of three sports to keep you cognitively fresh so that you're not bored in one area over the other. And it should be a nice balance between a hobby and an obsession, right? I'm never going to become a professional triathlete because I'm a pharmacist and that's what I signed up for. But at the same time, what things can I grow in resilience outside of work and so that I can bring some of those skills to work? See, Jason, you ran the half marathon. I did the other half that wasn't done. <laughs> that sounds better than it is. Since 2012, I've done 11 triathlons. No, I'm Amazing. not going to tell anybody that the 11 were from 2012, <laughs> 13, 14, and 15. It was back when. What distances do you do, Jason? I do what's called a sprint. I don't know if they're different in the States, but I do the sprint. The ones I did were Olympic distances. So what was that? Point nine swim. The run was a 10K and the bike was, I forget what it is now, 40 miles or something like 30 That's, miles, something like that. Yeah. And you're miles and I'm kilometers. So yeah. we're even more messed up. I'm swimming 750 meters. Okay. So about a half mile. Yep. Half mile. Yeah. And then I'm transitioning into a 20K bike ride. Yeah. So that's 12 miles. I think ours might have been 25 miles. Sounds about right. It's Olympics should be about double the About sport. double. At about each double. Sport. 
Yeah. And then it's a 5K run. Yeah. So these were 10K runs. I'm not fast enough to do a sprint. So I just did it to get out there That's in the middle of it. Very yeah. cool. How many years have you done that? About five. Uh, I did a try, which is half of the sprint of everything. So that took me about 45 minutes a number of years ago. And that's when I realized, like, this is something I have to invest in here. This is, I'm hooked. And since then, I've had some progress. And I think when you look at your local neighborhood, people around you, there aren't that many males in their 30s that are doing this. Yep. And when you go to race day and you're competing against other men in that are in their 30s, you realize there's a whole community here and there's a lot of disciplined people. You think about that all winter and that there's nobody on my street that's doing this yeah. when I'm leaving my house at 6 a.m. on yeah. my bike. Right. But you imagine the competition out there and it motivates you to keep training. It's a cool thing. I did them back when I graduated high school. These were some of the first ones back in the mid to late 80s. And then I had a renaissance 40 pounds late or something like that. <laughs> I was out running one day when I kind of started. This is 2012. And this lady runs by me and she says, good for you. <laughs> it wasn't a fist bump or anything like that. It was like, good for you. Like even a guy like you is doing that. <laughs> and then Jason, I was a swimmer in high school. And so in swimming in the triathlon, I was maybe in the top 25%, just because if you're not a swimmer, it's not easy to start swimming. But then biking, I was way down in the 25% on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then running, I was even further down. So I'd get out of the water relatively in front. Swimming's hard if you haven't done it your whole life. Yeah. I don't think I ever passed anybody the whole <laughs> time I did triathlon. I just had these people <laughs> passing me. I'm the opposite. I'm a terrible swimmer. So I pass people on the bike. You because, get to pass them. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. I get passed a lot, but it's, I, I suppose it depends on the race, but I come out of the water in the middle of the pack or less, nothing special. And I have, I usually have time to make up and I now can make it up on the bike. And my run is, I would say just solid. It's not top. I'm not winning any runs, but I think the local races that I do are, we make family trips out of them. It's a weekend or it's something we bring the kids. So I'm gone maybe three, four hours of the weekend. No big deal. The kids can sleep in a little. And so it's something that brings us out and we plan vacations around some of those schedules in areas that the kids like. And I think last year was a competitive a more competitive year for me. I found a neighbor around my age and we've pushed each other. So I, last year I was, I podiumed in my age group and that had never happened before. Wow. So when that happens, you sort of want to keep going, right? Yeah. And you want to work harder at it. So this is back like, what, 10 years ago. So this is my mid forties and I actually won my age group. That's us. Well, not so much, Jason, because my age group was people who were 45 years old, three months, 12 days, and born before noon. So it was only like a five-minute wide age group, but in my mind, I won. <laughs> so you're one of one. I did it just for attention kind of in my family. I don't tell others, but I did it for <laughs> attention. And once I'd come home and my wife would no longer say, hey, good job. My kids would not say, hey, good job. I stopped. If I'm not going to get accolades from them, <laughs> then I'm not doing it. But good for you in doing them now over the years. It means you've got a better, a different and a more advanced drive than mm -hmm. I had. My thing is I practice sight reading on the piano every day. And the cool thing about that for me is no matter what happened at work or with relationships, mm -hmm. even if you felt you went backward during the day, it's a way to say that for yourself, you've committed and you're moving forward, whatever that is. It's symbolic in a sense that you're doing something that is different or more important than work, at least in that little area. I think it's about progress and it's about shifting gears from what you do during the day 
right? The variety is what keeps us fresh. Yeah. And in pharmacy, you don't necessarily feel the same progress because you're not really creating a ton day to day. Great. You filled X prescriptions or you gave X vaccinations and that's all very good. But there's something else that is, there's something else to say about progress for something that's just you. And I think the individual part is important and it allows you to fulfill an identity that you're creating for yourself. I talked to a cohort years ago and we're still in contact now, but years ago and I was telling them how much I enjoyed piecing together a remodel of my first house in the basement. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And he said, Mike, the reason you enjoy that so much is because think about your job, basically. You go there in the morning and the place looks exactly the same when you left. And he said, we don't get the pleasure as pharmacists to see that concrete movement. And quite often you feel like you're spinning your gears. No doubt. And that might be mitigated if you own the store. Perhaps there's things that you want to create, programs that you can invent, and they're up That's to right. you when you can decide to do it. Or maybe there's maybe it's just about money for some people. But I think if it's your store, perhaps you have more opportunity to create or decision-making potential. Yep. But I think either way, humans will thrive on progress and on fulfilling an identity and doing good things. One of the cool things about being an owner is you get to kind of surf that line between the normalcy of life and a little bit of chaos. You're right on that right on that line. It's kind of a nice place to be. You're not overwhelmed, but you're not bored. And boy, owning your own place, you can really get skewed into the chaos. But the one thing I like about ownership is typically, especially with self-directed projects, you you have that luxury of dipping into that chaos a little bit and into the boredom a little bit just to be on that line. But when you're working for somebody, quite often you're in that boredom side or you're in that really chaos side and you don't have your own choice of kind of going in that nice line down the middle. I think the pharmacist gets the chaos side at the beginning of a new learning curve. So you certainly get that when you graduate. If you get promoted to a managerial type of position, that's going to exist. Then you become an owner, perhaps, and that exists again. I remember when I first became an owner, the first two years were like drinking out of a fire hose. You're learning the financial part of what you've been accomplishing for a long time. And can only imagine how things work. And then you have to understand how the business really works. And you have to understand what you have to do to maintain it. And then COVID happened for us. And we've got to change the way things are done in the pharmacy. And I think, knock on wood, at this stage in my career, I think we're just starting to feel a little stable. Where that curve has flattened out a little. And I have a little more time to invent and like you said, I can venture into chaos, but at my choice. At your choice. At your choice. Yeah. And if it's your choice, you welcome it. But if it's forced upon you, it's a stress. Right. Like if someone yeah. said, hey, Jason, tomorrow I want you to wake up at 5 a.m. and hop on your bike and then bike over to a freezing swimming pool and get into your <laughs> Speedo at the YMCA, you'd go crazy. But if it's your own chaos that's a blessing then that's a cool thing well not only do we know that you wear a speedo i'm being generous <laughs> with the speedo let me tell you <laughs> no i think that is the idea here that maybe i haven't thought deeply enough this is probably a block at some point hmm. but the idea that if we have the ability to choose our challenge we will be very successful yeah if, if when some people find out that I do triathlons and they go, why? Like they don't understand why you would do that to yourself or why you would choose to do that. But it's not for me, it's not something, it's not a switch. It was a gradual process that grew like a plant. And here I am. Yeah. And 
I'm sure that same person has something else that I would ask them. Why right. or how, how are you a provincial chess champion? Yeah. And you swam competitively as a kid, or you played this varsity sport, or you're a cello player. How is yeah. that even possible? Right. But those are challenges that that person chose to seek out, and thus they're very successful at it. I was halfway decent in high school. The one time I thought I beat someone, this is a 200-yard race, so was that eight laps? He was leading me, I could tell, by a body length. And then all of a sudden, he's nowhere. I passed him, and I was going in for the win. And I realized that he lost his swimming suit on the last turn. <laughs> that was my big win in high school. So he made a choice, too. <laughs> <laughs> he made a choice to stop there. Yeah. Jason, what is your most negative emotion as you go through this in terms of something that maybe you're not proud of, but you can't shake? I think. Early on in my career, I had a mentor that pointed something out to me and I wasn't self-aware enough or I didn't have enough examples from life yet to figure it out. And I think this is something that I have written about this year and feel better about now. I'm still not perfect, but another few years of examples in my life will allow me to get better at it with practice. And that's not taking something so personally, mm. accepting feedback and not being, not carrying it as long as I should. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah. Whether it's a patient confrontation who they come in and they've got their own experience and history and baggage and our job is to help them. And I'm the innocent bystander that's in their way and they attack your character and they say things about you and they put things on Google My Business. Or it's it's a parent that for the coaches, the kids' sports teams that I'm coaching. Or it's another employee yep. who is talking negatively about the way we're doing something. Or it's something that you overheard that a colleague said about you. Pharmacists are in a leadership position every day, whether they like it or not. And whenever you're in a leadership position, the fingers get pointed at you. We're not trained to, to process that properly. And if we are, when we're in school, we probably don't have enough life experience to be able to digest it all in one setting. It just takes time. Roy, years ago, I was fairly narcissistic, probably in, up until 10 years ago. I want everybody to love me. I wanted to be mm -hmm. the mayor. I wanted too much of an image. And um, that got blown to crap after a few things in my life. It's probably the Speedo. Yeah, probably the Speedo. Now I can count on one <laughs> hand the people that I know support me. It was a combination of, um, you know, uh, well, a lot of it's when business goes down. And I say you can hide a lot of stuff if you cover it up with $100 bills. But when things start going south, you find out who some of your enemies are. And I was talking to my wife just the other day about it. She didn't want to look bad in front of something. I said, get used to it. I said, I got a ton of people that don't like me. But I said, that's leadership. All the things I think about, whether I treated someone this way or did this or that, it's usually because of my leadership position. It was rarely just when I was a member of something. And so I think you put yourself in those positions and you do have to remind yourself, I've never been a big one to say, well, business is business, but it is business because you wouldn't be in that position if you weren't mm -hmm. in the business. You wouldn't have that relationship of dominance over submissive and things in real life. So it is business, but it's hard. I think you said the word narcissistic or you could insert other words. But I think there's a theme there, whatever the word to describe it is. If you're going to be successful, you have to have an element of maybe, I don't know if it's selfishness or yes, it's drive and motivation and all these discipline and all these things. But it, there's also, you have to want it. And if you want it, there's, it's a, you care about yourself or you care about being the best at something, you know. Um, so I don't necessarily think 
that some of those words are bad, but they have you have to be self-aware and they have to be presented the right way. You were saying it earlier about uh, you know getting on stage or coaches and things like that, and I feel sometimes guilty. I coach my kids a little bit and stuff. I feel kind of guilty for not doing more of it, but there are some coaches that really feel like they should be there. That's their thing. And when you talk about being on stage or being in front of people, whether it's social or podcast or on stage, there's enough people that don't want to do that, that would never do it. And if mm-hmm. everybody felt that way, there'd be nobody to do stuff like that. So I think you're right. You have to have some of that drive, whether you end up being a coach or whatever, you have to have a little bit of that drive, but it gets kind of confusing whether it's a good goal or, or, or not so good. But if you don't have it, nobody would be coaching. Nobody would be speaking. Sure. Nobody would be doing anything. So you have to have some impetus for that. Yeah, there's, there's a characteristic, a personality characteristic that certainly has someone that puts themselves out, that puts themselves in a vulnerable position to be attacked. And that person is comfortable being the guy or the girl that is going to have to answer to something when it doesn't go well. That's interesting. And that person has to be comfortable in themselves to understand the why and the process that they've developed so that when it doesn't go well, that they don't take it personally. And they say that this is the best decision that could have been made given all of the data points that I know. And I think being a hockey coach, being a boss at work, being an owner of a business, I think I'm more empathetic to others where I'm not invested. I'm a Leafs fan. When I listen to the executives of this professional hockey team and how much gossip and how much media attention they're getting, I listen to it and I empathize with them in that they have to stand there when they lose in a press conference and they have to be the leader of this organization, the face of it. And they have to know that during the year, they did everything that and navigated everything in the best way possible. And that when the media points to them as it being their fault, they got to sleep at night. And the only way they can do that is knowing that they had the best processes and they, there's some information that they can't even share. And I think that's a big part of being a leader. Yeah. Is under being okay, potentially allowing the other party to walk away thinking that they won and not having to defend everything that you're doing because you're comfortable with yourself. You're comfortable with the process that you developed and the people that are surrounding you. I think to handle that well, that pressure, you have to have a feeling that you're supposed to be there. And if you're supposed Mm -hmm. to be there, sometimes you pick the worst of two evils. All right. I just got to I'm a hero. I'm a hero. I'm 500% on CPR. And so I had a guy who about 25 years ago, he dropped outside of our store from sudden cardiac death or arrest, you know, and I knew CPR from my swimming lifeguarding years. And I went over, gave him CPR and he had a nice long life. He just passed away about two months ago. Another lady fell in our store and I wasn't so lucky with her. She died. It's remarkable because you hear about CPR stuff and I've done it twice, just like in my pharmacy. It was really strange to think you were there. My wife She doesn't like that stuff, doesn't like blood, doesn't like if someone gets in a bike accident, she doesn't want to think about it. In my mind, it's like, this already happened. I'm there. A terrible situation happened. And I'm not going to make it worse. I'm going to pick the best of two evils and do something. I cannot fail 
in an accident. I cannot fail because I'm supposed to be there. It's already happened. I'm just going to try to make it better. And I think that kind of like you're seeing with the leaders and the coaches, they know that they're supposed to be there. And if they're supposed to be there, I don't think those arrows hurt so much because they've got to make some choice. I think there's probably an instinctual part of being a leader where you want to be the person who can positively impact something. And you're not just okay with staying on the sidelines and hoping that someone else does it. And you actually feel more comfortable being part of the answer. If you had two choices, you could stand on the sidelines and hope that someone creates the right, defines the right answer. Or you could be involved in the trenches and be part of the process of coming up with what is hopefully the right answer. I would pick the second option. Two years ago, my kids started playing hockey and I grew up playing competitive hockey and I'm comfortable with the game. And I asked them, I said, do you want me to coach? And they said, yeah. And that's a proud moment for a dad. Your kids want you around and they want you around in front of their friends and they want you to be the creator of the culture and everything else that has to happen around a sport. And I said, look, when parent feedback comes back or a decision that you made on the bench is being being scrutinized, I would rather be in that position than be a fan in the stands and saying, oh, he should have put that player out there or we should have did this. And I just feel I'd be very unhappy not having, not being part of the inner workings of what led to a solution to a problem. I would rather be in the trenches and part of the solution. I hate the thought of coaching. A lot of it's because I don't trust that I should be there. I just hate that thought. But other things, when you're there, you feel like it's your, whether it's your God-given role or something inside of you, you just feel like for some reason you're there. And then a lot of stuff bounces off you because you're like, well, you're the guy. Perhaps it's a sense of control or you're getting constant updates about the situation. So it's being, you're able to monitor it as opposed to being left in the unknown. And you have the ability to adjust if anything is going astray, as opposed to waiting for a boss to make a decision. And I think the world needs both. The world needs people that are going to be told what the job entails in a dispensary that might be to stand here at this point of the day and to do this and to do it this way. And they might be given an opportunity to give their opinion. And then they don't want anything to do beyond that in terms of controlling the situation. And then there are others who instinctively want to give their opinion and, and roll with it and experiment their opinion to see if they're right and then adjust. And as long as they're capable of realizing when they're wrong and making, bringing in the right people to fill the gaps that they have then they're probably going to be a very good leader, but they have to be willing to put themselves out there and be vulnerable. If we were all bosses, then we wouldn't get much done. And like you said, if we were all, I can't think of the right word, but maybe it's- Are you looking for the word hero? Maybe, is the leader the hero? The guy that saved someone's life, the CPR guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good example. And a same story happened to me where someone collapsed in the grocery store pharmacy that I work in. And- Naturally, when that happens, all the eyes come to you. And if I don't, I have to behave a certain way now. And if I'm a, if I have to lead the group here and instinctively, if I'm not the person to start that and to put myself out to, to be vulnerable and test the hypothesis that are going through my head, then we need a leader at this moment in time. And if there's, there isn't one around, then we're all going to be in trouble. So I think the world needs leaders and the world needs followers. And it's about putting the right people in the right mix so that we have the right mix. If we're all leaders, we're going to be arguing about what's right and nothing's going to get done. And if we're all followers, then nothing will really get beyond the starting point. My guy... When I was giving CPR, I already had my hero speech ready. I was getting all psyched up. You know, people are going <laughs> to raise my hand up and I'm there. And this guy, the ambulance takes him away. 
This other lady who was there takes his mom away because she was in the car. Someone else does this. I'm standing there by myself. No one to even hear my speech about. I had to go in and brag about myself to my wife. (laughs) Jason, there's going to be times when someone is in a role they shouldn't be in. There's some people that probably have to make the decision like, this is not for me. Every pharmacy manager went to school to learn how to be a pharmacist. Those are two different roles, very different roles. And so many times in our profession, the pharmacist is not necessarily a manager, but there's no one else behind them to take the position. And it, they're essentially a pharmacy manager with a pharmacist named him. Sometimes they don't want to be the manager, but there's nobody else. Other times, yeah, they want to, or more like my situation where I wanted to be a manager, but I, it was early in my career and I was just starting to figure out how to be a pharmacist. Yeah. Within the year, a manager was let go and it was either me or the stream of relief pharmacists. Yeah. And you realize that it's better if I just learn how to be a manager. And then I start thinking about what courses can I take and what we're used to having a credential to do something. And there is no credential to be a pharmacy manager, right? And I think that person at that point needs to find mentors and needs to hear stories and have constant communication and be vulnerable and share with that mentor things that are going on so that they can learn and be self-aware. And then if they do that for a number of years, they'll be very successful. Yeah. It's when they're not doing that, that they won't be a manager much longer. Right. Either the, the profession will force it out of them or they'll, 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 they're, they won't be happy long-term and something will change, job change. They'll leave the profession. I think the hard thing about young managers is that I think some of the workers can smell the blood. Let's say you're a golfer. I'm not a golfer. Let's say you're a golfer, though. You want to raise up the ranks. They don't throw you in right away to the masters. You're starting playing your friend, and then you're playing maybe high school game or something like that. The problem of leadership is you're often thrown into a role that's beyond you, You're a 23-year-old kid, and now you're in charge of this store or whatever. And the workers, some of them can smell it. You didn't start off as your first management job as running the lemonade stand on your corner after you graduated from college. You're thrown right in there, and people can smell it. And I think a lot is thrown on young leaders, which actually gets easier as you move on. You get older, you get gray hair, people start looking up to you, that kind of stuff. But It's hard. It's quite an imbalance. I think the staff buy-in piece is not talked about enough. But the sooner you can get a team together, that buffers all the problems coming your way. And I, I think back, I was 24 and I had been a pharmacist a year and I had a smaller staff in a retail pharmacy that was well established in the community. And it wasn't a problem about having buy-in from the patients. I had been there a year and I grew up in the town and the patients, if I'm, if I'm the boss, they're going to accept that whether I'm younger or older than I currently was. What I noticed was that the older staff, I don't know what age that would be, but the older staff were automatically accepting that I was the boss now. Yesterday I was a pharmacist and today I'm in charge and they automatically accepted that. And the younger staff, I had to earn it. And if you could identify which those are, then you can attack it from a different point of view. But you don't have to spend a lot of time with the person that's automatically accepting it because they just do it. And I find that an older generation is used to a very paternalistic hierarchy. And if he's the boss, he's the boss. That's that. And they don't ask questions. And the younger ones are... They've potentially have been there longer than you, and they're, they haven't understood the transition here. What's made this official? I think 
if you can find a way to make their life better, they'll be on your side. I remember the specific circumstance in my first pharmacy manager job where I obtained buy-in from the younger of the two full-time pharmacy assistants that were with me. And this person was, either we got off on the wrong foot for every reason, or we were both stressed and trying to figure out our own roles. But I remember she was being reamed out at the cash. And I was within months of me becoming the manager. And I stepped in front of her and I said, Susan, go ahead and go for lunch. The fact that I did that showed tangibly that I was in charge and I was willing to take the bullet. And then I told the patient, let's restart, explain the problem, and I'll solve it for you. Just in a genuine way that had composure in a calm way, but I'm coming in as a neutral third party without any yeah. emotional attachment to the situation. She just wanted out of the situation. And later I found out that this person had told the other, the older staff member, the one who I'd automatically gotten buy-in from, that I was the best manager they had because they'd had a few over the year. And from then it was a lot easier. Once I got in the staff and they saw me as their leader, then we could do stuff together and we could talk about the stuff and we could figure out what exactly they needed and what I needed to provide to them so that they could provide the things that I needed from them. But if you don't have the buy-in, then what's the point of trying to solve any problems if you're not going to stand up for each other? When I came into my store, my dad was kind of on his way out. I think one of the problems was it was never really made clear that the torch had passed. And I think that's what I was talking about earlier in terms of I didn't mind the arrows from people. It was the people that were sort of testing your leadership, even though obviously they weren't going to lead because I had the nepotism. I was the next guy. I was qualified in my mind. Mm -hmm. But you're right. The older people, maybe that ship has sailed or they were comfortable in being led. But it was the people that you know, were kind of testing it out. I'm not maybe completely innocent, but if I could have done it over, I think I would have come in. I can't see myself doing this. Picture in my head, though. I picture coming in and firing half the staff. Let's say we had 20, firing half of them because some I knew would never turn because I'd grown up with that through college. I knew the situation. The problem there, though, is then you might lose the other half who feel like kind of a, a bonding. Then you're there managing no one. But in my imagination, that's what I feel like I would have done. It doesn't really make sense on paper. It doesn't seem terribly healthy, but some of those rules seems like they were set up and they were never going to change. You talk about standing in and taking the punch and that kind of stuff. And I can see that. I, I just, um, sometimes what was it Jim Collins? Good to great. Sometimes you got to change the people on the bus kind of thing. Bingo. Bingo. I think the more difficult skill that the leader is trying to use here is to figure out the type of people that will be complementary to each other to allow this to happen without conflict. And it will take a variety of personalities to have the best product come from that pharmacy. But putting those people in the right seats once you have the right people is an important part. Yes, and sometimes there are times where we have to get people off the bus. And we're better off figuring all that out first before driving it. That's what Collins is trying to say, right? You know, otherwise, we're going to drive halfway down the road with the wrong people on the bus and then have to restart. I think being, being part of the team and listening and allowing them to tell you what they need is a big part of it. But it's sort of counterintuitive to being a leader, right? The traditional leader is supposed to tell people what to do, not be told by the experts doing it what to do. Yeah. So I think 
the emotional, having that emotional intelligence, whatever they call soft skills are not all that soft to me. They're incredibly important and not everybody can do that. Jason, one thing I thought was cool to hear you say is the importance of writing to get your thoughts out. And I think that I've used a hell of a lot of chat GPT lately just for not that kind of thought, just for plug in chug, some of the show notes and the blog post and things like that off the transcript. But I'm not a big proponent of saying that high school kids shouldn't use chat GPT. Let them have it just like that in the calculator and things like that. I think though where the problem is, writing is so important to get your thoughts from your head in a cohesive style out on paper, even if nobody sees it. Yeah. That is so valuable. And I think that's where some of the AI is going to take some of that away. It's so valuable, the thoughts that you put into those articles, and you got a ton of them on LinkedIn now and Medium and so on. Those are so valuable to think things through. It's more than the output. It's what happened in your mind to get that output there. And uh, boy, those kind of thoughts are needed. And your leadership training, Jason, which we didn't, get, or, which we didn't get into a, enough of, it's okay because I think our conversation showed the depth of the need for it. Here you're a triathlete and I'm a hero and we still have to sit here and talk about our own idiosyncrasies of leadership and so on. So it's very much needed and the pharmacy world is going to be a better place with you in it and you sharing those leadership skills. So thank you for what you're doing. I encourage all the listeners to obviously sign up for your newsletter and we'll put a link in the notes. So keep it going. I look forward to keeping in touch and thank you for what you're doing. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the voice, Mike, and keep up the good work. All right, Jason. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. Thank you.